botany students. Here is our very first set of notes on plants. You'll have to forgive me, I have a little allergy sniffle, so if I do that, I apologize. I'll try not to do that very much. Here we go with introduction to plants. So I don't want you to write anything on this slide, but just note that every once in a while I'll say a key answer and that's when I'm giving you an answer to a question that will be asked at the end. So you should write down those key answers as you hear them. I won't, they won't appear on the slide, so it'll just be in my voice. And then that will help you to answer the questions at the very end of the PowerPoint. And I'll be looking for those in your notes. So this is just a little practice with that. Here we go. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what is a plant? Plants just like animals, have certain characteristics that put them into the kingdom plantae. Okay. One of those characteristics is that they're eukaryotic. So they're in what is known as the domain eukarya. So just like animals, plants have cells that have a nucleus. Okay. They also have cells that have membrane-bound organelles. The cell walls in a plant, so the very outside of the cell, contain a substance called cellulose. That's what makes them harder to digest for us or harder to chew. So the more cellulose that's in the plant cell walls, the harder they will be to chew. So they have a cell wall, a cell membrane, and that cell wall has cellulose in it. Unlike animal cells, which do not have a cell wall. Another very important thing is that plants can carry out photosynthesis using chlorophyll A and B, just two different types of chlorophyll that absorb different wavelengths of light. Okay, but they can, they can do that. Now, not all plants are going to meet all of these characteristics. Some plants do have the cell walls with cellulose and are eukaryotic, but they don't carry out photosynthesis because they're considered parasitic plants. We'll talk about those later. Now here's your first key answer. One of the other characteristics that's not down here is that most plants are multicellular, meaning they have more than one cell. There are some single-celled green algae, and it's still up for debate whether those belong in the plant kingdom or whether they belong in a kingdom by their, themselves. Okay, now we're going to talk about the things that plants need in order to grow. Just like we need certain things as animals in, to maintain life, plants need certain things. And those can be broken down into four categ categories, excuse me, sunlight, water, minerals, and gas exchange. Okay, we'll talk about each one of those. The first is sunlight. Sunlight comes in to the plant through the leaves, okay? And it's the where photosynthesis, so the process of making food takes place in plants that have chlorophyll. Okay? The leaves of a plant you can see are broad and flat and thin and you've picked up a leaf at some point in time in your life and you could see that there are very thin structures and this is to maximize or get the most light absorption or amount of sunlight coming in to do the most photosynthesis. The thicker something is, the less likely that the sunlight can penetrate all the way through. So plants have leaves in order to make their own food. And I think we already knew this. Okay, another thing that plants must do just like us is they must have gas exchange or perform gas exchange. On our Kahoot, one of the questions was, do plants, that plants do not need oxygen? And we said that was false because they do require oxygen just like us to be able to use the food that they make. And that process is called cellular respiration, which we will go through at a later time in class. But they also use carbon dioxide, and most of us know that, you know, plants take in what we breathe out, and that's the carbon dioxide. 
So carbon dioxide is used for photosynthesis to make food, whereas oxygen is used to actually consume or break down that food. And plants need to do this, exchange these gases with the atmosphere, the air around them, and the soil, and they have to do it without losing too much water because water is a very important part of making food and of photosynthesis. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to talk about are water and minerals. Minerals are nutrients that are needed for plant growth, and those are usually found in the soil. So you can think of those kind of like our vitamins. When we say we take a vitamin and mineral supplement, there's certain things like iron and calcium and magnesium and potassium that we need to get in our bodies in order to do all of the functions. Well, plants are the same way. They need those minerals and vitamins to be able to do all of the processes that they need to do. And they, they also need water. And we know plants without water will die just like we would die without water. Water is very essential for plants being able to support themselves, stand up straight, but also for photosynthesis. If they don't have water, they can't perform photosynthesis. Now here's the thing, again from our Kahoot, one of the questions was, can plants take in water through their leaves? And that is an absolute no. It must come in through the roots. Okay, so it does no good to water your plants up here. It, all the water has to come in through the roots. And then another one of the questions talked about soil and whether it was needed. So it's not really the soil that's needed. The soil does help support this little plant here, but the soil contains the minerals that are necessary to do all of the other things that a plant needs to do. Now we're just going to go over a very brief overview of the plant kingdom and then a couple other things about how plants affect our life. So this is still kind of up for debate, but right now the plant kingdom is divided into five major groups. Just a couple years ago, it was still four, and now we've most scientists have added green algae to the plant kingdom, making it five groups of plants, and that's based on how they form their babies or embryos, how they're able to conduct water or bring water from one part of the plant to the next, whether they form seeds or not, and whether they are able to form flowers. So this diagram, what you see here, is called a cladogram. And a cladogram is an evolutionary history. It's like a family tree for evolution and for plants. So we see the plants down here on this end are the least developed. They don't have any of these characteristics here. Okay, And every time you move up and get to one of these little nodes or one of these little characteristics, then you know that all the plants after that have that characteristic. Okay, So if we get, if we go to embryo formation, all of these groups up here have embryos. So the groups are green algae, the mosses and their relatives, the ferns and their relatives, the pine trees and their relatives, and then the flowering plants, which we know very well. Here's just some examples of some plants. Here Oops, here being a, that is a liverwort, which is a relative of a moss. Here's obviously a pine cone, so one of the cone-bearing plants, gymnosperms. Here's another relative of the gymnosperms. These are ginkgo. This is another example of a moss. Here's a fern, an angiosperm. Okay, so lots of different plants. One of the last things that we need to discuss is why are plants important to us? We think that, why are we learning about this? Why do we care about plants? You could not go a day without something that's been contributed by plants. So they affect every facet of our lives. They are the backbone of life. 
One thing that plants do is they produce the oxygen we breathe by taking in the carbon dioxide that we exhale, and then they use the carbon from that, and they breathe or let go of the oxygen for us. So they actually make the air that we breathe. They also help move water. Different plants have root structures that can be very long. They can move water from one part to another. They can help purify the water by taking up uh, bad things, bad minerals, chemicals that are in the water and in the ground so they can help us in that way. For our climate, this is a big one. They store excess carbon. So when our factories give off uh carbon monoxide in our cars, the plants are able to take that in and they keep the carbon inside of themselves. Trees are really good at this. They use carbon to make all of the structures that form wood. A couple other ways that plants are the backbone of our life. They provide habitats for animals and for us, so our houses and things that are built out of wood, even plastics are made from petroleum, which is layers and layers of dead plant and animal, but mostly plant material. Of course, they provide food. Everything we eat comes directly or indirectly from plants, and that'll be on the next slide there. And they provide for a lot of other human needs, like medicine, clothing, shelter, and food. Okay, so that difference between direct and indirect. Okay? Something that's direct is going to come directly from a plant without any modification. So we don't have to do anything to it. You pick an apple off the tree, or you go to the store and buy an apple, and you eat it. There was nothing that was modified or done to that apple, so that would be a direct use of a plant. An indirect use of a plant would be making bread. So you take the wheat, you take the sugar cane, you make sugar, you make um, flour, you get a little bit of fungus in the form of yeast, you get some water, you mix it all together, you bake it, and you get bread. Okay, So that would be an indirect use of a plant. Another thing that we can talk about here is the difference between a primary and a secondary and even a tertiary consumer. A primary consumer is something that eats the producers, which are the plants. So down here is the plant, the producer. They're also called autotrophs. So the primary consumer are... Oops excuse me, our triceratops here is eating the plant, okay, and then the big T-Rex comes along and eats the triceratops, yum yum, and that becomes, he becomes the secondary consumer. If something were to eat the T-Rex, like us, then we would be the tertiary or third level Consumer. So plants are the producers or otherwise called autotrophs because they make their own food. And then we have primary consumers and secondary consumers. So sometimes we can be both. We can be a primary consumer or a secondary consumer. But since we cannot sit in the sun and make our own food, we can never be producers. Another thing that we need to mention is that at every level that um, we go through. So producers bring in the most energy, are able to use the most energy from the sun. And then as this primary consumer eats this producer, it's going to get only about 10% of the energy that is in the producer. And then the secondary consumer only gets about 10% of that. And if there were a third level consumer, it would only get about 10%. And that's another key answer that you will need. So here are just a couple more examples of direct and indirect uses and the definitions if you didn't get those on the last slide.
Hey. Um, hey guys, I have an obsession with my dog. He is extremely adorable. This is my daughter. And um, just for all of you who don't know, marching band is a sport, and it will always be a sport. And she's a dork, and we're done. I'll shut his daughter. Okay. And we're going to wrap it up with the... Okay, so go ahead and make sure you get these answers in your um, notes that you'll show me. And let me know if you have any questions. You might have to go back and listen again or maybe look them up if you didn't catch them the first time through. I will talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.